Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Diego Ortiz. I'm the communications director for the American Heart Association. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this special conversation, Summer of Health. We want to thank today's presenting sponsor, NYU Langone Health, for supporting the mission of the American Heart Association across the greater New York area. In just a minute, you'll meet Melissa Alizraki, a dietitian nutritionist from the Center for Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease at NYU Langone Health. She will share some of her summertime nutrition tips. Then we'll meet Dr. Sean Heffron, exercise physiology specialist from the Center for Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease at NYU Langone Health to discuss how to move more and stay cool in the heat. And finally, you will meet a very special volunteer and student, Isabella Kubis, who will share a heartfelt story about a recent CPR save, save followed by a hands-only CPR demo by Isabella and her teacher, Mr. Sal Publisi from the Urban Assembly School for Emergency Management. And of course, we want to thank NYU Langone Health one more time for being today's presenting sponsor. All righty, so let's get started. Uh, welcome, Melissa. Uh, please turn on your camera and join the conversation. Good afternoon. So, Melissa, we're, we're here to talk about summer health, summer safety, and that starts with nutrition. Um, but let's let's learn a little bit about who you are. So tell us, who are you and, and what do you do? I am a registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist. So I work with patients at NYU Langone at the Center for the Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease. I've been there for a little more than a year, uh, but I've been a nutritionist for seven years. And I became a nutritionist because I love working with people. I know I wanted to be able to help people improve their lives in a meaningful way. Uh, but also I love food. I love to eat food. I love to talk about food. So this seemed like a pretty natural marriage of my interests. Well, I love it. I love food. I love to talk about food. I like I like to pick out food. It's 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 the best. Um, so 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 tell us what's the overlap between summer safety and nutrition. Summer is the perfect time to start thinking about preventing heart disease because when we look at the eating patterns that are associated with good heart health. At the foundation of all of them pretty much is eating more fruits and vegetables. And summer is when we have the greatest abundance of fresh fruits and vegetables in our area. So it's a really great time to take advantage of the great variety and freshness that summer has to offer us to put all those beautiful, colorful fruits and vegetables on your plate throughout the day, which gives us a great variety of vitamins and min minerals and protective antioxidants, which is the stuff that our body wants to perform optimally. Well, I, I love that. I mean, one of the things I love about eating seasonally is that there's always variety. Um, and I also, I also like it because I love to, I love to buy what's in abundance, but um, because sometimes it can be too expensive to buy our things when they're out of season. So is there any truth that eating healthy is too expensive? I think it can sometimes require that you be a savvy shopper, but it absolutely doesn't have to be true. So as you kind of touched on, eating seasonally is really going to help us here as well, uh, because you probably notice that when you go to the grocery store in January, if you want to buy some strawberries, you might be paying anywhere from six to, I don't know, up to nine dollars for those strawberries if you're in the city and you're trying to buy organic. Uh, but as you go to the stores now in June and July, you are gonna see that same carton of strawberries on sale for maybe closer to $3. Um, and I think it's also good to note here that seasonal buying seasonal helps, but if it's still for some reason difficult for you to access or afford fresh, frozen fruits and vegetables are a really good option. You just wanna be aware of canned because that can have the added salt and sugar. Well, you know, I. I think it's it's nice to talk about kind of generally eating seasonally, but what can we look for? Like what's 
in season during the summer that we can go shop for right now? So much. It's so glorious. Yeah. So when we talk about the fruits, you have all of the beautiful berries, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries. We've been eating them like crazy in my house. Mm -hmm. uh, also stone fruits. So cherries, peaches, nectarines, plums, and apricots are coming into season. Uh, and then for the vegetables, you'll start seeing fresh string beans, zucchini, summer squash, corn, tomatoes, cucumbers. That's not even everything. I mean, I feel like th this is the time, it sounds like, this is the time to be, to, to start this habit of eating seasonally um, because there's so much abundance and then you can learn um, what your favorites are season to season. So I, I like that. I also want to share, actually, I just shared it um, uh, in the chat box for all of our attendees. There it is. It's a great infographic from the American Heart Association that shows um, what's in season uh, throughout throughout the year. So 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 take a look take a look at that if, if you kind of want to learn more about not just summer but fall, winter and, and spring. Um, so M Melissa, why don't you tell us what are your top choices for this season? Uh, so something that I like to do is find ways to use the fruits and vegetables in a kind of a different application. So for example, mm -hmm. berries we were talking about, you can absolutely just rinse them off and snack on them like that. Uh, but sometimes it's nice to mix it up and you can do a cooked preparation for some of your fruits. So you get that kind of like caramelized jammy goodness of maybe a pie, but without the buttery crust and added sugar. Like there's a time and a place for it. It's just not all the time. Uh, so something you could try is maybe mixing strawberries with a little bit of balsamic vinegar. Uh, that pairs quite nicely. Maybe a touch of maple syrup and roast them up for mm. a different yogurt topping or take kind of the tail end of all of your cartons of different berries when they're looking like a little sad and shriveled, but not quite moldy, throw them all into a pan with a little bit of water to get it started. And any seasonings and flavors you enjoy, like maybe some lemon peel or orange peel and a cinnamon stick, and you make a mm -hmm. quick compote. And that's also a nice alternative. I love that, I love that. Um, I think it's important for us when we're talking about summer health to, to really talk about Moderation. I always think we have to talk about moderation. And the question I I want to I, I want to ask you is around the like the family barbecue because when I think of summer, I think of the family barbecue, right? Whether it's for Memorial Day or Labor Day or Fourth of July or Father's Day, especially now that we're starting to gather again. Um, so how do we stay heart healthy at the family barbecue? Yeah, I think there's two important factors here. One is to kind of approach all of the offerings and kind of think critically about what are the parts of it that you enjoy most, right? What are the mm -hmm. foods that you love at those barbecues and kind of plan around it so you can maintain, like you said, that balance or moderation. So for example, like your aunt is bringing her famous potato salad and she only makes it twice a year and you know you're going to want some and your mom's brownies are legendary and you know you're going to want some of that. So then you're gonna maybe take it easy on the chips, skip the sugary beverages and choose a protein that's a little bit leaner, maybe the chicken instead of the steak or the burger. So you make room for the foods that you really love and you're gonna be present and enjoy it and not mm. feel guilty. And for, you know, I, I hate showing up to a party or barbecue empty handed, but I also wanna make sure I'm bringing something, something that people are gonna enjoy. So well, what advice do you have for me? Yeah. I think that that's also a great way to make sure that you're going to have all of the food groups that you want on hand at the barbecue to think mm -hmm. about a balanced plate. So I think some really good options, things that are sometimes missing from the barbecue spread are your non-starchy vegetables. When we think about like our balanced plate here, right? I've always got it nearby. A registered nice. dietitian always does your plate method, <laughs> right? You want to make sure that you've got some veggies on the plate to balance right. everything out. So bringing a salad with some sturdy vegetables that won't wilt when pre-dressed can be great, like a nice refreshing tomato and cucumber salad. Mm. Uh, another thing that you might wanna think about is what kind of carbohydrates are on offer, because mm -hmm. sometimes this is all very like macaroni salad, potato salad. If you want something with a little more fiber, a bean salad can be a great option. Um, something like a black eyed pea or a, bean, a black bean salad mixed with veggies and a light vinaigrette really great to offer your hosts and make sure that you've got some nice heart healthy alternatives for your plate. I love it. So you're saying it's okay to add color to your plate at the family barbecue? Yeah, 
you want to enjoy all manner of things at the family barbecue, all different colors, all different food groups, right? What you want to mm -hmm. do, what's most important to me is you make yourself your one plate, right? You try to hit all your food groups. You can still look for balance, even if some of these are not your usuals, right? And then the key is after you finish this one plate, you're going to pause. You're going to sip a cool drink and you're going to ask yes. yourself if you're hungry before you go for seven. I love it. And I feel like that should be the that should be the mindset, not just at the summer barbecue, but throughout the year. And, and especially now, I think a lot of us are going to be kind of eager to get out, eager to, to socialize, but we can still do it. We can still do it in moderation and keeping our, our heart health in mind. So um, I, I love I love all of the all, everything that you just said. Um, something else I want to touch up, touch upon is. Um, you know, summer could easily be a season where we drink a lot of iced teas and lemonades and, and sports drinks, and they have a lot of sugar. And, you know, I, I often think about when I was a kid and I always wanted to drink my, um, my iced tea in, in the summer. Um, what should I have been drinking? Yeah. And it's so interesting because the sugary beverages are not really quenching your thirst very well anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so other options that are going to quench your thirst, be more heart healthy, there's always water and seltzer and flavored seltzers um, and an unsweetened iced tea. You can buy all different flavors and brew them up in advance, leave them in the fridge. Um, but you can make it a little more interesting by doing an infused water or seltzer. You don't need fancy equipment for this. You just can put into your glass with the water and seltzer any matter of fruit. And in addition to different fruits, you could add things like cucumber slices, you could do herbs like basil and mint or some of my favorites, or even slices of ginger root. And it's gonna perfume your water. You can customize it. I think it's like a fancy little alcohol-free mocktail that you get to make yourself and hydrate. Well, I love that. I just, I just shared in the chat box for everyone um, who's listening, we have 12 infused water recipes that you can use in the summer or really throughout the year. And you just, and you just really made me think of, so my, my father has diabetes and he came over for the weekend for Father's Day. And um, I made him a nice infused water, uh, infused um, water lemonade with a little seltzer, a little water, and he loved it. I drank it all weekend and I think I'm gonna keep it in the refrigerator all summer long. So. Um, so I, I like that you mentioned that as well. Um, well, Melissa, we're almost at, we're almost at time for this, this portion. I would love for you to maybe share with us your final thought or your final tip, um, as we're going into a summer of health. Yeah, I would say I have two quick ones, okay. right? First, I would encourage you to challenge yourself to try a new fruit or vegetable this summer. Now is the time whether it's something exotic from a farmer's market that you've never seen before, or just something from your local grocery that you're not in the habit of buying, now is the time to give it a go. It's gonna be a peak freshness, it's gonna be beautiful. And then finally to close, to just say that whatever you're eating, whether it's an occasional ice cream cone or that first fresh, juicy, beautiful peach of the season, right? Whatever you're eating, you're gonna be present with your food. You're gonna be connected with your body, how it's feeling when you're eating and you're gonna enjoy. Thank you so much, Melissa. I wanna share one more link in the chat box as we have been talking a lot about farmer's markets and eating, eating seasonally. So um, this might be a, a better uh, resource for our viewers in New York City, um, but that's the uh, New York City farmer's markets map and location. So you could find one in, in your neighborhood and in, in your zip code. Um, well, Thank you so much on behalf of the American Heart Association. Um, I'd love to have you, you know, in, in a future um, webinar to talk a little bit more about the role that uh, nutrition and, and uh, our diet plays on our heart health. So I, um, I, I'm offering, I'm extending an invite now for a future conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'd love to. It's been great. Fantastic. Have a healthy summer and take care. Thanks. You too. All righty, so now let's shift gears a little bit during this conversation. And we now we've got now we've talked a little bit about the, the fuel that we're putting into our body. Let's do something with that fuel. Let's welcome Dr. Sean Heffron, who's going to talk to us about the role that exercise plays and also how to make sure that we are mindful of our health while we're exercising in the heat. Um, Dr. Heffron, welcome. Um, why, don't, why don't you start by telling, 
telling us a little bit about yourself and why you do what you do. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, my name is Sean Heffern. I'm a assistant professor of medicine here at, at NYU. I am specifically a preventive cardiologist within the, the NYU Center for the Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease. And while I'm a cardiologist, my interest in a healthy lifestyle and preventive medicine predates uh, my, my going into medicine or actually interest in medicine at all. Before medical school, I, I pursued graduate school in nutrition and exercise physiology. And so I bring a, a big focus on a healthy lifestyle into my practice of preventive cardiology here. So you're just the guy to talk to today, it sounds like. Yeah, I, I love everything prevention. All right, well, well, let's talk about it. So, so we always, so the American Heart Association, one of our pillars is move more. Talk about the, the, the importance of, of exercise, of movement, any way you can get it. So tell us, what is the benefit of physical activity and how does it help our hearts? So physical activity really has a myriad number of, of benefits to the hearts, M many that are measurable, many actually immeasurable. Uh, at, kind of at its, at its most basic uh, and, and measurable, we know that regular physical activity is strongly associated with reductions in blood pressure, uh, which is a, a major contributor to cardiovascular disease, having elevated blood pressure, that is. Mm -hmm. uh, it also helps maintain blood sugar. Uh, at a healthy levels and along those lines helps maintain a healthy body weight and can facilitate weight loss uh, and being overweight and obese certainly contribute to high blood pressure, insulin resistance and high blood sugar, uh, diabetes as well, which contributes to, to cardiovascular disease. Uh, and, you know, just being, being physically active provides kind of strength for your heart and for your entire body. It, it, increases your efficiency and overall cardiovascular fitness uh, and trains you just to, to put you in a better overall state of health. Th those are the, the measurable kind of, kind of components. There are also all sorts of cellular biological things that we, we do in the lab, but not kind of in the clinic uh, that exercise benefits. Uh, and that's kind of combines to have a very big association with reduced heart disease. I love it. I think I'm going to say exercise good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> without a doubt. Um, all right. Awesome. So are there any dangers um, of not getting enough exercise? Oh, uh, well, yeah, certainly I get, you know, I humans evolved over, you know, thousands of years and it's really over the last, you know, not even hundred years, but even last few decades predominantly in which we've become relatively inactive and mm. humans evolved to be an active species and that activity maintains our, our body's health. And, uh, you know, it's a lack of, of physical activity that has contributed to the, the epidemic of cardiovascular disease and obesity in the country. Uh, and so and when you don't exercise enough, then you're prone to excess body weight, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, diabetes, and you know, premature atherosclerosis. Uh, and you know, as well as kind of non-heart related issues with, with muscle weakness, uh, lack of stability problems uh, that we encounter certainly with aging. Uh, and so kind of a, I would call a very often, very common physical activity, the, the normal state uh, as it were uh, for the human body. I love it. And we definitely want to normalize it. And we want to encourage people to get active any way they, they can, um, whether that's walking, doing chores, a hobby, just move, just move is what we tell people. Um, but why don't you, why don't you tell us, uh, what are exercises that you recommend for someone, especially residents of New York City, Long Island, or the greater New York area who may be watching right now? Sure, well, the first question that I ask every patient that comes into my office who, where I'm seeing in regard to a exercise consultation is to tell me what they enjoyed doing uh, when they were in school uh, or you know, whether that was high school, what sport they played or what they liked to do on the weekends or, or even back, going back to elementary school. Uh, and think about that. And if it's something that they can you know, do again now, uh, then, then go for it. 
Uh, if it's something that might need to be modified, I mean, playing tackle football, probably not, probably not going to be done, uh, you know, in your 60s or 70s. But, you know, taking that as a starting point for sure, because exercise should be fun. It isn't. Uh, I, I don't want, if you like going to the gym, running on a treadmill, watching a television, that's fine. Uh, and you're being active. That's great. But many people don't do that, but they feel that exercise needs to be that monotonous, painful, non-enjoyable activity. And it, it really shouldn't. Physical activity should be, should be fun and should be a, a participatory and enjoyable activity. And in New York, uh, certainly in the summer, there should be no shortage of that. Uh, you know, now the city is opening back up and we're having tourists come from, you know, all around the country, but, you know, New Yorkers should become tourists again in their own city. Get outside, and walk. Be on yep. your feet. I mean, that, that's something that, you know, New Yorkers have become very accustomed to and taken for granted mm -hmm. over, you know, the hundreds of years of the city's been in existence. But the last year, even New Yorkers have become sedentary. So get out there and move and take advantage of, of all the public parks and, and the access for, for activity that we that we have. Basketball, uh, you know, the, the increasing availability of bicycle lanes and rental bicycles uh, and, and be creative. The city's gotten creative. There are there's free kayaking, I know, in the, uh, the Hudson, uh, East River, one, one of the one, one side of the island, uh, at least I know has free kayaking and maybe both now. Uh, you know, there I'm seeing increased amounts of climbing walls uh, available, uh, you know, so, so be creative uh, and, and get out there and do something that sounds interesting and, and challenging. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'd be uh, remiss to not mention that, you know, maybe not in, in Manhattan, uh, but certainly within the five boroughs and as we go out to Long Island, uh, golf you know, is, is an activity that is uh, available and, and a great source of, of physical activity, as long as you're not riding the cart and drinking <laughs> the entire 18 holes uh, for, for people of all ages. Uh, so you know, exercise, physical activity should be fun. Sean, I, I really like, I really like the, the first and last point that you, that you made. So um, I'm reminded of a few years ago, I wanted to get back into a hobby that I loved when I was in high, middle school and high school, and that was um, rollerblading. So I bought a pair of rollerblades. I went to the skate park a few times. I was going up and down the ramps, jumping over you know, obstacles and stuff. And then one time I went up the ramp, I came down and I landed on my shoulder and that was it. I, was, I, was, I said, I need to find an age appropriate hobby. So I actually started playing golf. I've been playing for about two and a half years and it's great. And I love that you mentioned that if you walk, that's where that's when you get the, the benefit. So um, that's just my 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 two cents, my, my little anecdote. Um, let's talk a little bit more about walking, though. You know, New York is a walking city. Um, is if, if I if I walk is does that count? I mean, am I am I reaching my my um, recommended minutes of exercise just by walking? Uh, it, it certainly does, and uh, you know it's it's not a coincidence that you know, New York City has relatively low rates of obesity uh, compared to you know other places in the country. Certainly, that there are multiple factors playing into that, but the fact that mo many New Yorkers are very active and they get a lot of activity just through walking plays a role in that. Uh, the the typical New York pace walking as well is a pretty brisk one, uh, and so it would without a doubt, count for the 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity that the American Heart Association uh, recommends uh, over the course of a week. Uh, if many people probably, it would, it would count as high intensity physical activity. Uh, and you know, the, the research, there's reasons for that we consider that because the research studies have borne that out, walking, uh, you know, you can derive many of the exact same benefits uh, as you know, directed physical activity in, in jogging or any other exercise. Yeah, I, I can say that walking from Penn Station to our office near Bryant Park is um, definitely a contact sport, um, an endurance sport, but I, I think it's one of the best ways to, to really start your day. So um, hopefully that will be, that'll be something um, as we return to our commutes and walking becomes a part of our habit 
um, again. Um, Sean, let's let's talk let's let's talk now to the people who may have a tendency to uh, overdo it with their exercise. So, um, what? Uh, who? Who? Uh, how can we talk to folks who might want to overdo it with summer exercise, and how can they um, prevent some of the more serious consequences? Sure, uh, you know that's something I counsel even my well-trained athletes uh, mm -hmm. on is that. You know, don't don't overdo it. You know, you're you're certain unless you're playing in the NBA playoffs or finals. You know, there's no reason to give it your all to the point of exhaustion. You're you're only likely to to cause some kind of of injury. You know, more likely uh, some orthopedic injury, honestly, because if your muscles and, and bones aren't used to very high levels of physical activity, you're you're likely to to strain something, tear something, lose your balance, fall and, and break something. Uh, and, but certainly in the summer, going all out when you're not well trained, certainly in the middle of the day can, can lead to issues in regard to the heat uh, and heat stroke becoming dehydrated and, and whatnot. So I, I encourage people, you know, have fun, enjoy yourself, but, you know, leave enough in the tank to, to be able to do the same thing the next day. Uh, as well, specifically related to to the heat, you know, in, during the summer, exercising early in the day, later on in the day, when you know we have the luxury of it still being some degree of light out, uh, but not direct sunlight, that will help reduce the the risk and and uh, of heat stroke dehydration uh, that could be associated with that, and certainly you know taking breaks. Uh, you know, if, listen to your body. Again, this exercise should be fun. If you're panting and huffing and want to feel like you want to collapse, uh, that's not a fun feeling. So listen to yourself. Take some time off, you know, take 15 minutes off and then get rehydrated, maybe have a little snack and then, then go back out and, and continue doing what, what you were doing. Uh, you know, especially in the summer when it is so hot and, and people are sweating, losing a lot of, of water, uh, as well as electrolytes. Uh, this could be an appropriate time also for hydration specifically with, with an energy like Gatorade, electrolyte replacement type beverage. It's not something that I encourage on, on a regular basis uh, you, but because they do have calories and you know most people, uh, unless you are being very, very active, losing a lot of water and electrolytes, it doesn't give you any more benefit than just plain water. Uh, but in the summer in particular, if you are outside and it's hot, you're losing a lot of sweat, then replacing those electrolytes as well, as well as the fluid is important. Oh, I love it. I love it. So get active, avoid, avoid the midday hour so that you, it's a little bit cooler, take breaks, stay hydrated. Exactly. Perfect. Perfect. So what are some other ways for people to get active and maybe, you know, practice some mindfulness? Um, during the summer? Sure, you know, the exercise doesn't have to always break a sweat necessarily either. Uh, and, you know, just doing strengthening type exercises or activities such as yoga, uh, stretching, other type of isometric exercises are, can, are very helpful in building muscle strength uh, and stability. Uh, in particular for, and you don't have to be young to do these activities either. The, the stability and muscle strength in particular becomes very, very important as we get older. Uh, and these are activities that, you know, are again, very available in New York City, bo both indoors and out. Uh, certainly, you know, the outdoor yoga classes proliferated last year. Uh, and so these are activities that are also foundational to, to a healthy heart and uh, and a healthy body. And, you know, as things are reopening and a lot of us are getting back into our, our old routines, what advice do you have for those who want to get back into their routine, exercise routine after 15 months off? Sure. I mean, this, I give the same uh, advice to the people who have, who have taken 15 months off, but even those who, who weren't exercising before, but you know, now had an excuse, <laughs> a better excuse to not do it because you know, the gyms are closed, there's a pandemic. You know, I, I wasn't encouraged my patients to go to the gym over the last year, uh, of course. Uh, but you know, now things are better. We're, we're opening up, you know, 
hopefully everyone is vaccinated uh, as you should be to protect yourself from from COVID and it's a it's a safe environment and you know the, take use that as your excuse to 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 start that exercise program because you know you you've weathered the last 15 months get out there and enjoy yourself that being said hearkening back to what we talked about in regard to being healthy and safe in the heat you know take your time uh, again you're not going to recoup all of your fitness that you had 15 months ago within the first two weeks uh, unfortunately uh, it, it takes a while to build back up to where to where you were before uh, and to make gains if there, if you weren't all that in great in that great shape to begin with so take your time that being said you know don't be afraid to as you get used to it increase that intensity a little bit uh, in a gradual basis uh, you know either the, the duration of exercise or the intensity i i tell people that never more than 10 percent uh you know increase in time or intensity within a week period but that doesn't mean that every week has to be a 10 percent increase either you know two percent three percent over time uh, is still associated with benefits but take your time slowly ramp up and and don't get discouraged it takes a long time so important to get back into it but every little bit helps you know there's research that shows standing it can take you know add years onto your life when you replace sitting with standing uh yeah. so th that being said you should be out moving as much as you can but don't be discouraged if you you know it takes time to ramp up your fitness or you miss a day it's rainy whatever uh, don't di get discouraged. Go out there the next day. Give it a shot. I love it. I love it. Let's let's encourage people to get out there, ease into it. Don't get discouraged, and and slowly build up to where they were, and, and maybe even um, uh, exceed what their goals were originally. Um, I love that very much. Um, you know, the 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 second to last thing I want to ask you, um, Sean, is something that that was uh, very public that that happened a few weekends ago. Um, we saw uh, the Danish soccer player. He had a cardiac arrest competing at really one of the world's top soccer tournaments. If it can happen to a world-class athlete, how can, how can I or any weekend warrior avoid cardiac arrest? Sure. So I'll, I'll say that, you know, I, I don't, I, no one, as far as I know, other than his doctors are privy to exactly what happened, but being a cardiologist and seeing exactly what happened, I would say that, you know, that people shouldn't be afraid of the, that whatever happened to him was most likely due to something that he inherited genetically and it was, you know, very unlikely, very, very, very unfortunate. Uh, and, you know, the, the number of people that, that experience something like that is thankfully small. So don't let that scare you away from exercise. That being said, you know, uh, uncommon things do happen every once in a while. And that's why it's, it's so important to, to learn the things that we're going to learn about uh, after you and I are done talking, like, like CPR, uh, because it, it's kind of pretty obvious and established at this point that, you know, he doesn't seem to have suffered many ill consequences and that is, you know, largely due to the fact of, that he and CPR was initiated very rapidly, and there was a defibrillator on site and applied and activated very rapidly, uh, which saved his life and saved him from from adverse consequences. Well, Dr. Heffern, I, I appreciate the the segue into our our next uh, portion where we're going to hear from Isabella and uh, Mr. Puglisi. Uh, actually show us a CPR demonstration. But before we, before we leave, I'd like to give you the opportunity um, to share a final message. What message do you want to leave our audience with? Sure. I, the, my message is, is that, you know, a healthy lifestyle can be enjoyable. Uh, Melissa spoke about delicious foods that are also healthy for you that bring a lot of pleasure. Physical activity, exercise, should bring you fun and enjoyment, expose you to, to experiences that you wouldn't otherwise have, shouldn't be a chore. Uh, and together they, they combine to, to extend and improve and enhance our life. Dr. Sean Heffron, exercise physiology specialist from the Center for Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease at NYU Langone Health. Thank you so much for joining us. 
and we wish you a, a healthy summer. My pleasure. You as well. All right. Thank you so much. And now I'm so excited for the, this next part of our webinar. Um, I, I really am enamored with this, this group of volunteers. Um, I'll ask uh, Mr. Puglisi um, to turn on the camera and, the, and uh, his microphone so that we can say hello. Good. Hey, Sal. Good morning. How are you? Good, morning. good, good. How are you today? Doing, doing well and doing really great. Thank you so much. So, so Sal, why don't, why don't um, you tell us a little bit about the work that you and the students at Urban Assembly School for Emergency Management have done? And then we'll chat with Isabella for a few minutes. Sure. Um, we've been, uh, I guess, we were founded in 2013 as a, uh, the first ever high school for emergency management in the United States. We've uh, grown pretty dramatically over the last couple of years. We've tackled a lot of uh, community inequalities. Um, the CPR team came to life by a simple ninth grade uh, lesson teaching kids about emergency response time. So, you know, one of the cool things about having kids learn with emergency management, we could pull really cool data sets and it's all live data that's real and kids can kind of like read through it, do some math and kind of formulate their own ideas without us spoon feeding. And um, students got to see after doing research with uh, just 911 calls, there were there's some real big discrepancies in times. So, you know, our high school is very proud about, you know, throwing out novel community problems and giving the kids the opportunity to solve them. And a group of kids started brainstorming ideas and they came up with, well, if we can't expedite the ambulance or get traffic cleared, why don't we see if we can get people to learn CPR in those communities that we identified that have, you know, these outrageous response times. And then a couple of kids started to notice, wait a minute, these are our own neighborhoods. So the light went off and um, we created the hands to heart CPR team here at the school. And, uh, you know, even during COVID, we had to modify, but we're, I think, at about the thousand mark now. We've trained a thousand teens and adults um, hands only CPR. And that is that's spectacular. And not only have you trained other people, I know that Isabella ha has an amazing story of, of a life that she saved. So yep. why don't we why don't we welcome Isabella? Sure. Hold on. I gotta, we got to modify a little bit. We're uh... <laughs> okay. Yeah. This, so this is live and we're coming to you live from the hallway of the urban assembly school. And, um, hi Isabella. Hi. Let me start by congratulating you on all of the success that you've had. Um, Isabella is also a candidate for our, uh, greater New York team of impact. And I think they're going to find out very soon who the winner is. And I know Isabella was among the top candidates. So, Congratulations um, on that success. Thank you and, so much. Oh no, of course. And and tell us. I mean, you you just did something extraordinary um, that involved CPR. Won't you share that with us? Okay. So, hello. My name is Isabella, and I'm a junior at the Urban Assembly School for Emergency Management. I am a founding member of the Hands to Heart CPR team. Um, I never thought that I would use CPR and witness my training so soon after getting um, CPR certified. This past summer, a family member was found unresponsive in the backyard pool. And me, with the help of a family member, we delivered CPR compressions until EMTs arrived on scene. Um, after a couple of days at a local hospital, everything was back to normal. Um, I my, and my family was so grateful that we had the training and I had the training to step up and answer the call. Because of this training I received as a member, I now know what to do in case of any emergency. My family are also very grateful that we knew this skill and knew what to do to step up. And it is really important to know this skill because we never know when it might come in handy. So just being part of this team and receiving this life-saving skill really helped me at that moment because otherwise I wouldn't know what to do. And inspired by this experience, I joined the American Heart Association Greater New York Teen of Impact campaign to continue to grow awareness for the importance of CPR training communities. And um, I raised funds for the AHA research. Well, Isabella, I mean, we, we are so grateful um, to have met you and that you, you know, are, are taking part in not only the Greater, um, Teen, Greater New York Teen of Impact uh, program, but really just that you're out in the community teaching this skill. Let me ask you, did you teach your family hands-only CPR? I did. And they also stepped in and performed it? Yes. 
along with you? Yes. That is just remarkable. You, you're amazing. You're amazing. Well, how, how about this? Let, why don't you teach us now how to do hands-only CPR um, on that mannequin in front of you? Okay, great. So um, the first step is always to call 911 and call for help. Um, this would be the start of the hospital ch out of hospital chain of survival. We next after that we have to check if the person is responsive and unconscious. So we would check if by tapping on the shoulders we would have to tap aggressively. Um, we would have to watch if the chest rises or falls. So if the person is breathing, right after we would place our knees right close to the chest. So we would make compressions easier. The closer, the better it is. Um, then right after, we would place our hands in the middle of the chest, right between the nipple and the, where the sternum lies. And we would interlock our hands to make CPR compressions easier. So I'm a right-handed person. So I would use my, it's important to use CPR and press with your palm. So I'd line up my hand and interlock my other hand. And with our arms locked, we would push hard and fast for about 100 to 120 beats per minute. It's really important to have a straight back because posture is very important. Allowing, having a straight back and our hands are interlocked with our elbows straight, it makes it much easier to perform CPR compressions without getting tired. Um, we also have to, providing compressions also allows the oxygenated blood to be transported and circulated throughout the body. So it allows the person to receive the oxygen needed. It is really important to know this skill because we never know when it might come in handy in general. Well, Isabella, why, why don't you show us one more time, starting from the call 911, and we'll go through it one more time um, so we could see it. Okay, so we would ask, um, we would like shake the person, tap on their shoulders if they're okay. And then we would check the breathing if the chest rises or falls and check if the person is breathing. Right after we would quickly begin the CPR compressions, pushing at a rate of 100 to 100 compressions. And we would basically continue these compressions until EMTs arrive on scene. And then right after, after 30 compressions, we could also use the AED if we have one. But if we don't have one, we just continue with compressions. That's excellent. That is excellent. Thank you so much, Isabella. And you know, one, one thing that, that I always think about is, even when I was learning hands-only CPR, is that it can get really tiring, right? And it, it, you know, to, 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 to do re CPR compressions repeatedly. So why is it so important that more people learn this skill? Well, the more people know this skill, the better, because we can't continue CPR. And of course, in New York City, ambulance response times are really long. And having more people to help you allows you to kind of have a reset and then continue um, giving CPR compressions until EMTs arrive. Well, that's it. That's it. You heard it right there. And you, you also heard it from Isabella that it can happen to someone close to you, someone you love. It could happen at the family barbecue, at the gym, at the pool party. So please learn this skill. Um, and, and you could learn more uh, about the American Heart Association's uh, CPR programs um, at cpr.heart.org, um, heart.org slash hands only CPR. And I'll share that link in, in just a second. Um, Mr. Fuglisi, do you, do you want to, um, Maybe leave us with, with a final thought um, on the importance of, of hands-only CPR and also of the great work that Isabella has done. Um, it's just become, I think, the majority of our students become very passionate about it. Um, you take a lot of high school students and you know high school kids have a bad reputation, but um, once they get comfortable with doing something like this and see the, uh, the impact it can make on a community, they, it becomes quite addictive. I know when we had to stop for COVID, um, a lot of kids were frustrated. So we had to like modify and we started doing uh, hands-only CPR family nights where kids can log on with their families instead of doing game night. And we gave them tutorials on how to build a mannequin at home. And, you know, it's really taken off. And, um, you know, having Isabella here, and unfortunately she had to use a skill, but it really gives a, a, a youth voice to this whole cause. Well, Mr. Felici, you're doing phenomenal things with your students. Isabella is testament to that. We know that CPR saves lives. It only takes a minute or so to learn. 
Um, so please continue the great work that you're doing. And I really look forward to finding new and creative ways to collaborate. So Sal, Isabella, have a safe and healthy and productive summer. And we'll see you next school year. Absolutely. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. So everyone, what a phenomenal webinar. Um, it was my honor to bring it to you. Um, on behalf of the team at the American Heart Association and our presenting sponsor, NYU Langone Health, thank you for attending today's presentation. We want to extend a sincere thank you to our guests, Melissa, Sean, Sal, and Isabella. Just phenomenal. Um, we wish you a happy and healthy summer with heart. Take care, everyone. <laughs>